Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to the webinar. We're excited today on a very timely subject of EEOC background screening lawsuits. Thanks. Scott, welcome to the webinar. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to... to um, what we're going to be talking about today, as Bob suggested, is the EEOC's criminal history guidance, um, what has taken and also best practices. What do we do about it? There, there's a slew of, of different emotions um, that clients have from you know, frustration to uncertainty. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is what do you make of it now? What do we do about it now? From a year or so ago about the Duke University Cancer Center. Uh, Duke University had looked to um, boost its institution. Um, they identified a candidate in, I believe, South Dakota who had the power. And Duke University decided to bring him in, and right away he got off to a fantastic start, biggest scientific magazines in the United States. And that led to a stage four cancer research as a last hope for people in the end stages of cancer. And many, many people were very excited about it. And enthusiasm grew. And with that enthusiasm came increased prestige for Duke University and increased attention. At some point, some whispers started to take hold and people began to wonder why certain results didn't seem to maybe came. And according to the 60 Minutes report, within some months, they realized that the commenced was, in fact, um, invalid, that it appeared many of the results that generated the And it was obviously an enormous disappointment for those people that were involved in the trial who looked at a credible black eye for Duke University Cancer Research uh, Center, which um, has many, many wonderful things to contribute and certainly for something like that. And the last thing that the report did is it looked back what could Duke University have done to avoid uh, the fact that this scientific researcher was not what he presented. Uh, does anyone think he's actually a Rhodes Scholar? He determined that while he had recorded himself as being a Rhodes Scholar, he in fact was not one. Um, but apparently Duke University Cancer Center had him an employment opportunity. Um, one of the things that I have seen through the years is that background checks are, are crucial. Background checks has not changed. Uh, what has changed, though, and in, in especially the last handful of years, are the risks associated with running background checks in a way that, that may be controversial. One area where we have seen a lot of movement in just the last year or two, the EEOC is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, a federal agency charged with investigating discrimination concerns, among other things, and, um, analyzing and monitoring and suing employers related to background checks in a way that they never... Um, many of you may have heard that the EEOC came out with new criminal history guidance in April 2012 for the first time in about... When the EEOC comes out with criminal history quote-unquote guidance, they are not passing a law and they are not implementing to do either of those things. But that being said, their uh, guidance carries significant weight for looking to head off uh, potential discrimination suits. Many employers have complained for releasing the guidance. Most of it seemed to be uh, assembled in the cover of night. Um, I, I actually had a chance to talk to EEOC, and I asked him a little bit about the back room a process that led to the creation of the criminal history guidance, and it actually might surprise a thousand times worse than it ended up. Um, for some, for many employers, that won't be much consolation, but you should know that um, you know backroom debates and discussions within the EEOC, and there were lots of people on on uh, you know on the side of the fence, burdensome for employers. What are the biggest take-home points of the EEOC's criminal history guidance? Use of criminal background checks by employers was having a disparate impact on minorities. So some of you may say, you know, I background checks are with the use of criminal history information because if you look at the federal law that they enforce called Title VII, nowhere in convicts or discrimination against felons. 
And so employers have asked me, you know, why is the EEOC getting involved in this? Because it believes that while employers may not be intentionally discriminating against individuals in certain groups, certain situations could have the effect of hurting minorities. And the two minority groups that they have identified as being the most are African Americans and Latinos. Um, those are not my words, those are their words. Um, what they have said is that they are going to lawyers saying that their use of criminal background screening reports is having a disparate impact on minorities. The EEOC has told employers in this guidance that you ought to do a handful of different things. And again, they don't have the power to, to say that this is a legal requirement, that it's a law or it's a regulation. But they say if you want to avoid a, um, a lawsuit by us, here are the steps you ought to take. The first thing they say is when you get a criminal conviction back, you need to consider the nature of the crime, the nature of the job, and the age of the offense. So here's an example. You know, let's say you are hiring for an office position. And the office position does not involve driving. And you conduct a background check and you find out that the individual in question has had a felony DUI from a handful of years ago. What the EEOC says you ought to do is you look at the nature of the crime, a felony DUI, you look at the nature of the job, which is an office job that doesn't involve driving, and you look at the age of the offense, a handful of years ago. And you make a preliminary assessment about whether that criminal conviction is really substantially related to the job or not. In the example I gave you, when it's a, it's a driving-related conviction, but the job does not involve driving, I can tell you the EEOC would say that's not really substantially related to the job. And so if the exclusion of an applicant in that sort of situation would have a disparate impact on minorities, then according to the EEOC, that could run afoul of the federal law against race discrimination. What the EEOC says is do this preliminary check, analyze these green factors, the nature of the crime, the nature of the job, and the age of the offense, and then if you reach the preliminary conclusion that there is a substantial relationship and that you plan to disqualify the applicant based on what you have learned, the EEOC says don't stop there. And what's important about this new criminal history guidance is it introduces this concept of an individualized assessment. That's the buzzword that they use. And really what it means is that the EEOC believes that you ought to look at seven, eight, nine additional factors to determine if someone is really the, the risk that they first appear to be. So what are some of the factors? They say look at the education that the person has gotten since the crime took place. Does that education suggest that there may be not the risk that they might otherwise be? Have they been rehabilitated in some way? Do they have a rehabilitation certificate? Have they gone through some sort of drug rehabilitation program? How many years have they worked since the crime took place and have they had a clean work history? Have they done something similar to the type of work that they're applying to you for? The EEOC says look at these types of additional factors to determine is this person in question really a threat to you or not? Those are the biggest things in the EEOC's criminal history guidance, but there are two other things that are worth mentioning that are getting a lot of employers' attention. The first is that they say in most situations an employer should not have a criminal history question on the job application. That always raises an, a lot of eyebrows when I mention that point. Um, even now, most employers that I'm aware of have some form of a criminal history question on their job application. Here's why the EEOC is concerned. It's, a, it's thinking this. Imagine you get 20 job applicants for a position, and each of them fills out an employment application in which they indicate whether the person has been convicted of a, of a crime or not. And three out of the 20 say they've been convicted of a crime, and 17 leave that box blank. What the EEOC thinks that employers will do is they'll immediately disqualify the three and just focus on the other 17. And the concern from the EEOC standpoint, again, is that 
if we are, if employers are disqualifying people for checking the box, for indicating that they've ever been convicted of a crime, then the EEOC's concern is that's going to have a disparate impact on minorities. So the EEOC says in this new criminal history guidance, it's going to view an employer's inclusion of a criminal history question on a job application as inherently suspicious. Um, we'll talk a little bit later today about how the EEOC's criminal history guidance and, and its discussion of the job application criminal history question has also spurred a number of states and municipalities to pass laws and ordinances of their own that by law preclude employers in certain or all circumstances from asking a criminal history question. So one thing we want to, we, it's worth discussing today is does it make sense to have a criminal history question on your job application at this point or is it a better idea to push that criminal history question into a deeper stage in the process? That's one of the things we'll talk about. Um, the last, I'd say, big point in the EEOC's criminal history guidance is that Title VII, the federal law governing discrimination, takes precedence over state law criminal history disqualifiers. They threw that in there. Um, when people began to realize the significance of that statement, many people began to get nervous. Let me give you an example of, of what the EEOC is saying. So in my home state of Wisconsin, there is something called the Wisconsin Caregiver Law, which covers health care entities. And the Wisconsin Caregiver Law says that at least with regard to 10 different criminal convictions, someone that is providing uh, health care to individuals in hospitals and nursing homes cannot have those convictions. Usually they're violent. So for example, Wisconsin has taken the position that murderers should not be able to provide care in hospitals. Makes sense to most of us. Um, what the EEOC has said is those types of state law criminal history disqualifiers are potentially preempted by federal law. So if, those, if um, abiding by those state law criminal history disqualifiers has the effect of hurting minority applicants, there may be a Title VII violation even if the employer is doing nothing more than following state law to the letter. Um, that makes a lot of employers in, in our world in the Midwest very nervous and, and I've talked to a number of employers from California to New York who have said the exact same thing. So one of the things we're also going to talk about during the course of this presentation is what do you do about that? How do you, how do you balance these conflicting interests and these conflicting laws? How do you implement that on a practical level? How was the EEOC's guidance received by employers? Um, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, it's kind of been a range of emotions. You know, the clients that I've talked to have expressed anything from, you know, confusion, I am not at all certain what the EEOC is saying, to frustration and fear. I know a lot of other employers who are just saying, listen, it, it, it's not worth the trouble. I am not going to spend my time um, trying to comply with the EEOC's criminal history guidance. It's not a law. It's not a regulation. My chances of getting sued are remote, um, and so I'm just going to leave it alone. Um, I can tell you where I fall is somewhere in between those kind of polar opposite reactions. Um, I think at this point in time, now a year and a half into the criminal history guidance era, it's worth doing some reasonable, pragmatic things to lower your risk. Um, there are things that I think that em most employers can do um, without an awful lot of trouble to limit their risk of a potentially crippling crap class action without unduly disrupting the hiring process. And another thing we're going to talk about today is how do you do that? What are some of the reasonable steps that you can take without making your hiring process slow or unwieldy? So as I mentioned, the EEOC criminal history guidance came out in April 2012. Um, what has happened since then? Uh, most employers don't know. Well, there, there have been three major lawsuits filed. And we're going to talk about all three of those today. Um, there's been a major court decision on a pre-existing case brought by the EEOC related to the use of criminal history information and credit information. There's been one settlement with the EEOC that they released a PR statement about that's worth at least knowing. Um, 
as you probably know, there's been widespread publicity about it. The EEOC's criminal history guidance and this new scrutiny of background checks has been covered in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, 60 Minutes, um, just about every major uh, newspaper and uh, publication in the country. Um, so people are paying attention to this. Um, you may have heard that there was a letter from eight or nine state attorneys generals uh, criticizing the EEOC guidance and saying it's taking and uh, making things um, uh, unnecessarily difficult for employers and for no reason. Um, those eight or nine states are mostly located in the south and the west. Um, so the EEOC is, uh, has provided an initial response to that, but it's a sign of a continuing political debate that has been spurred by the EEOC's criminal history guidance. Um, what we've also seen are, are many legislative changes at both the state and the municipal level. You know, when the EEOC talks, even through things like guidance, um, that guidance, again, carries some weight. And there are states like Minnesota, states like Delaware, municipalities like Seattle and Newark that just in the last year or two have um, made significant changes in their own laws that dictate how employers may consider criminal history information and when employers may consider criminal history information. And most of us would expect that sort of trend to continue over the upcoming years. Let's talk about the, the two biggest developments. These were uh, lawsuits filed by the EEOC in uh, spring of uh, 2013, so about six, seven months ago. Um, they brought them against BMW and Dollar General. Um, I suspect some of you may have a guess as to why they brought them against BMW or Dollar General, and your guess would probably be correct. These are, these are big employers. These are familiar employers. These are employers that are covered by major publications and press outfits in the United States and around the world. And so when they're involved in, in a lawsuit with the EEOC, that gets attention. And what the EEOC has tried to do since it released its criminal history guidance is to get employers' attention and to convince them to change their practices. Um, one thing that's noteworthy about the suits against BMW and Dollar General is that many employers would look at me and say, you know what, it seems like BMW and Dollar General were doing a, an awfully good job trying to be thoughtful about their use of criminal history information. Neither BMW nor Dollar General excluded any and all convicts or excluded any and all felons. They made a deeper dive. They tried to assess whether the convictions in question really were job-related or not. Both of them have what's called a matrix. I suspect many of you are familiar with that. Um, a matrix is essentially, uh, you know, the way I look at it usually is it's a table. And it says, if this person has such and such crime, then they're going to be excluded from the job. Or if this person has such and such crime, then we're going to ask them follow-up questions something like that. Um, both BMW and Dollar General had that sort of system and they both had it set up so that if individuals had certain convictions they were automatically excluded. Uh, BMW's matrix focused on things that most employers would think are very job re relevant to just about any position. Things like violence, uh, violence offenses, weapons offenses, drug distribution. Um, Dollar General similarly the EEOC still has taken the position in these two cases which were brought as class actions and remain in their early stages the EEOC has still said even these more narrow considerations of background screening data is not enough to avoid an EEOC lawsuit and what and the reason they say that is because neither BMW nor Dollar General had what the EEOC calls this individualized assessment criteria and that's what we talked about earlier. That's the seven or eight additional factors that go to whether the person has been rehabilitated or grown or developed in some way that suggests that they're not the threat that they might initially seem. Um, one thing that would be particularly frustrating for BMW and Dollar General, I'm sure, is that at the time they made these employment decisions in question, there was no such thing as the EEOC's 2012 criminal history guidance. It hadn't come out yet. The decisions involved here mostly were taking place in 2008, 2009, 2010. 
and they're just now germinating into actual lawsuits. And so, you know, many of the employers that I talk to not only think it's unfair that the EEOC is going after um, these employers, given that they didn't just um, exclude any and all uh, individuals with a conviction of any sort, but also because they're blaming them for not following criteria that didn't even exist when the employment decisions were made. Um, what we're going to talk about today is what should you make of these cases? You know, again, they remain in their early stages. We don't know how they're going to come out. But for both BMW and for Dollar General, these are major class actions. These are things that they're likely going to be dealing with for the next several years. Um, they involve major monetary risks. Big damages can come out of this. And you're talking big time and stress risks as well as public relations issues. Most employers I know don't want to be in this position. So how can you avoid it? That's one of the things that we're going to address as this uh, conversation moves forward. Th those two are not the only lawsuits, though, that have been filed since the EEOC's criminal history guidance. Most employers I know are not aware of this one. It's called Walden versus Cincinnati Public Schools. Remember earlier when we were talking about that situation where there's a state law that says an employer has to exclude certain people with certain criminal convictions? And what happens if that state law potentially brings you into conflict with federal law? That's this case. So the idea that that, that you know that language was just throw-in language by the EEOC is not true. Um, lawsuits are taking off under that idea. In this particular case, um, the Cincinnati Public School District fired 10 em district employees that they found out had certain criminal convictions that represented automatic disqualifiers under Ohio law. You know, nine of those employers were African American, and I can tell you that having you know read through the complaint, it appears that most of those convictions were fairly old. A, a, plain, a private plaintiff's attorney, not the EEOC, a private plaintiff's attorney brought a lawsuit saying that the termination of, in particular, these nine African American employees was a violation of Title VII. The school district immediately brought a motion to dismiss. And, you know, there's some question about whether that's the right procedural mechanism to use, but you'll certainly understand their argument. Their argument is, listen, the state made us do it. We're doing nothing other than following state law. The state says we have to exclude people with certain criminal convictions, and that's all we're doing. How could we be potentially on the hook for a Title VII claim? The district court judge in Ohio reviewed the, the motion and the response and ultimately denied the motion to dismiss. He found that there was a viable Title VII claim, and he reiterated a lot of the reasoning that the EEOC had used, that federal law trumps state law, and just following state law is not an automatic defense to a Title VII suit. And he even noted in there that the EEOC criminal history guidance agrees with that analysis. It puts employers unquestionably in a difficult position. And at the end of this presentation, we're going to talk about how do you deal with that. I'm not just here to, to bear bad news. Um, and you know, a lot of what we're going to talk about as this conversation moves forward is you know, how you can be practical about this, why this does not have to be the end of the world and certainly should not mean the end of, uh, of background checks. Um, one good news bit for employers is this case EEOC versus Freeman. Um, this was a case that the EEOC had filed uh, several years before the criminal history guidance came out. Um, and a recent decision came out from the judge just in this past year um, that analyzed in detail the type of claim that the EEOC has now mounted in BMW and Dollar General. In Freeman, like in those cases, the EEOC alleged that the employer's use of criminal history information, and in that case also credit information, was having a disparate impact on minorities. They say, yes, yes, it may be true that the employer was not intentionally trying to exclude African Americans, but African Americans were faring statistically worse in, when they submitted job applications to the company and that was because of uh, the company's background check practices. That's what the EEOC said. 
Um, notably, the employer in this case did not have a single blanket rule, again, that says, we do not hire felons or we do not hire convicts. The employer had a much more nuanced analysis. The EEOC ended up losing badly at summary judgment. Summary judgment's the time in the case before you go to trial where it's called the put up or shut up time. The judge needs to decide is there going to be a trial or not. And the defendant, Freeman, brought a summary judgment motion saying even in the light most favorable to the EEOC, the EEOC still loses this case. And they had a number of different arguments that the judge ultimately agreed with. The first one is that the EEOC can't prove a disparate impact. So remember, kind of the, the threshold inquiry in these Title VII disparate impact cases is that are minorities faring worse? And there, there's no perfect rule of thumb for, for what employees or how, how much um, minorities need to be faring worse. Some people say 20% worse. That's kind of a rule of thumb that was used 15 or 20 years ago. At this point, it's a little bit less unclear. It's a little bit less clear. It's going to depend more on individual judges. But in general, you're looking for a statistically significant disparity between certain minorities and other segments of the population. And the judge ended up saying in this case that the EEOC did a very poor job of establishing a, st a statist statistical disparate impact. The EEOC produced a database which the EEOC said showed that minorities were faring worse. But the employer did an outstanding job of showing that that database was flawed in all sorts of ways. And the expert could not reach the statistical conclusions that he did based on the information in that database. The other thing that the judge said is that, listen, you can't just treat this background screening policy as a single entity that's producing X, Y, or Z results. Because the company did not have a policy of excluding anyone that had any criminal conviction or anyone that had a felony. The company had a more nuanced policy. It looked at lots of different factors, including the nature of the job and the nature of the crime, before deciding whether an individual should be excluded or not. And so the judge said, you can't just treat this policy as a whole and say the policy is producing the result because there are many, many different segments of the policy and they can't just be uh, brought all together. Okay? And what the judge was making clear in that case is it's not easy to prove a disparate impact. So one of the pieces of good news for employers is that in the event that you do face a disparate impact case, there are arguments to make right out of the get-go to say the EEOC cannot show a Title VII issue here because they cannot prove a disparate impact. It is notable, though, in this case, too, that this case does not address um, the individualized assessment criteria at all. Um, it does not say whether the EEOC is in position to you know, ask employers to be incorporating the individualized assessment criteria. It doesn't at all opine on whether employers can avoid liability by following the individualized assessment criteria that the EEOC has outlined. The individualized assessment piece of the criminal history guidance is not a part of this case at this point. But still, it is very good news for employers. So we've talked about some of the big cases that have happened. Um, there is one case that settled out of the get-go before it really got to the court system. There's a company named J.B. Hunt. It's a big national trucking company. And the EEOC said, again, that the, the employer was wrongfully excluding individuals based on convictions that weren't all that job-related and that this was having a disparate impact on African Americans. In this case, the trucking company decided to settle quickly. For the trucking company, it meant that they likely did not have to produce a significant um, monetary award to either um, the plaintiff or attorney's fees to the EEOC of any kind. Um, they probably agreed here to a small monetary settlement only. Um, what was more significant for both the employer and the EEOC 
was J.B. Hunt's commitment to following the EEOC's background screening policies and, and criteria, um, including the individualized assessment. So this was a way for the EEOC to get a win up on the board, and it was a way for the employer likely to avoid a long, drawn-out and potentially expensive lawsuit. Um, but this is one example of, um, of, again, the EEOC pushing its agenda and putting pressure on employers to follow the EEOC's criminal history guidance. So what do we make of all this? You can tell that there are a lot of countervailing wins. You have the EEOC's criminal history guidance, which is getting a lot of attention from the press. You have the lawsuits that have been filed. You know, while there are not a million of them, there are certainly a significant handful of them. Um, we have the EEOC losing in the Freeman case, at least at the district court level. It's now appealing. Um, we have states and municipalities passing laws and ordinances on the use of criminal history information. Um, we have the settlement that I just mentioned with the EEOC. So you have lots of countervailing wins. And the question that I always get from employers is, what do we do now? Is it worth taking steps? Is it not? If we do take steps, do we go as far as the EEOC seems to be suggesting that we go? So we have this state of flux. Um, right now, what I am telling employers is, number one, try to avoid the neon light problems. So what do I mean by that? The number one mistake that employers can be making at this point is to have a written policy or a written contract or another written document that says, we XYZ company do not hire felons. We XYZ company do not hire people that have been convicted of a felony. That sort of written policy at this point in time is a mistake. You know, five or ten years ago, the goal of every employer was to ensure consistency, right? I hear that all the time. Consistency, consistency, consistency avoids lawsuits. And in many different spheres over the last five years, that has evolved in ways that are contradictory. And so now often, rather than seeking um, objective consistency across the board, employers are often being asked to make case-by-case -case assessments. You know, we're talking today about background checks, but you, you can just as easily see this in um, Americans with Disabilities Act disability accommodation cases, too. Again, in that situation, you're talking about case-by-case -case assessments. It's true in a lot of different areas of employment law. Right now, if you are an employer, one of the goals should be to avoid the types of neon light problems that if they come before the EEOC, are going to lead to at least a significant and lengthy investigation or are at least going to lead to a second look by a plaintiff's attorney. So one thing we're going to try to avoid are the big neon lights problems. The second thing that I'm suggesting most of my employers should try to avoid is easy class certification, right? The, the biggest risk in this area, in this background screening area, is not the one-off case, is not the single plaintiff case. The biggest risk in this area is a large class action. As you know, you know, large class actions are designed to handle situations in which a company does the same thing over and over and over and over again. So that when a judge decides if what that company is doing is proper, he or she can make a decision not just as to one particular job applicant or one particular employee, but as to lots of different employees or applicants at the same time. So one way to avoid that type of class action is to make sure that there are things built into your process or built into your system that avoid that copycat analysis that say, we can't evaluate this issue at one time. We have to be doing a single plaintiff case, one by one by one. Because your risk of big money damages or your risk of an extremely drawn out lawsuit go way down if you can reduce the chance of easy class certification. 
The last thing I think we're, we can expect to see big picture wise is a continued movement at the state and municipal level. As I mentioned, you know, just in the last couple of years we're seeing changes in you know, Seattle and Newark, um, in Delaware and Minnesota. You know, I could rattle off others. You have Buffalo. Um, there's a lot Philadelphia. There's lots of different places that are changing this right now. And so it's going to be important to do two things. One is to try to keep track of where things are changing at the state municipal level, particularly if you're an employer with a multi-state presence. But the other thing is to consider how you're going to make adjustments to handle those changes because as we're going to see on the next slide, those state and municipal changes are likely to present a more significant risk to you of a lawsuit than anything that comes down from the EEOC. Best practices for employers. This is really where the rubber hits the road at this point. Um, as, as we've talked about, you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. So how can we be smart about it? How can we be thoughtful about this stuff um, without going you know, too far, without making your hiring process impossible, without making um, you know, your termination or, or employee management systems impossible? Um, how can we be smart about this? Um, one thing that is wise to do today that was probably not necessary five years ago is to have a written background screening policy. I worked in this area for a long time. Um, when I got started, you know, your chances of facing a background screening lawsuit five years ago were not high. Um, those risks have increased materially today. And having a written background screening policy can help you in multiple ways. Here's an example. When the EEOC gets a complaint from a job applicant or employee, they launch an investigation. And the purpose of that investigation is really to determine whether the case is one that they ought to pursue hard, whether it just be through investigation or a lawsuit, or whether they should um, get rid of the case fairly quickly. Um, despite what most employers believe, you know, the EEOC does not have endless resources. It does need to decide where it's going to put its attention. You know, last year, if you look at the statistics, the EEOC only filed about 120 cases. So if you do the math, that's only a little over two cases per state. And overwhelmingly, those cases have nothing to do with background checks, and most have nothing to do with disparate impact, right? So what you're looking to do as an employer <laughs> is trying to avoid to be one of the handful of cases that the EEOC will pick up or one of the handful of cases that they will work hard to refer out to a private plaintiff's firm. Okay? One way to get off their radar quickly is to have written policies that speak to the issues that the EEOC is concerned about. So for example, saying that you follow Title VII tipping your hat to the individualized assessment criteria, right? Those types of things in print, getting rid of the, the criminal history question from the job application, those types of, of relatively small changes in a policy, in a written policy, can help to give you the proof you need to get out from um, an EEOC investigation hopefully early. So it's worth having a background screening policy in a way that it wasn't several years ago. A second thing I'm suggesting to certainly all of my employer clients is that you don't ask a background screening information like pre-employ for convictions that you won't use. Now the, if you listen to what the EEOC is saying, the EEOC says that you should actually be making a position by position determination about what criminal history information that you want. So if you go back to the example I gave fairly early on with the office worker, right? Uh, what the EEOC would say is, you know, don't ask for driving related offenses when you know that the office worker is not going to be doing any driving as part of his or her job. Now, the, the concern I get from employers about that is it's too burdensome. Um, most employers do not want to be making position by position assessments of what criminal history information that they want. Um, so if you fall in that bucket, 
I certainly understand. Um, one way to kind of balance it, to, to get some bang for your buck, but hopefully not to go too far or make it too difficult, is to say, listen, I'm not going to be making a position by position determination, but I will agree not to ask for criminal history information that I know up front I'm not going to want for any positions. For example, um, I have certain employers that will not want driving related offenses for any position. Well, if that's, if that's you, don't ask for it. Um, if you know that you're not going to look at misdemeanor offenses from 20 years ago or more, don't ask for it. You know, if you know if you know you're not going to look at minor drug offenses, or you know you're not going to look at you know other more minor crimes, don't ask for it, because at this point in time, if you're not going to be using in you're using certain criminal history information. Why take on any potential controversy? Because think this through for a second. If you get that criminal history information from pre-employ, the presumption is that you considered that information as part of your uh, analysis, determining whether to give the person the job or not. Well, if you know that you're not going to use that driving-related information, then why put yourself in the position of having to disprove use? The easier and smarter way to go is just not to ask for it from the outset. We talked a little bit earlier today about hiring matrices, which, which kind of were all the rage several years ago and I think are beginning to work their way out. As you know, these matrices say something like, if convicted of assault, do not hire. If convicted of um, you know, attempted murder, do not hire. Um, what I tell employers that I'm working with today is that sort of black and white outcome is no longer to your benefit. Okay, how can you have a matrix that still makes sense? Um, you know, one thing that I see many employers doing is instead of saying, "If you have an assault conviction, you are out," they'll say, "If you have an assault conviction, the company will review it." The idea is to, in some ways, line up a matrix with the type of you know deeper analysis that the EEOC is advocating for. Um, or at least not making it so obvious that you're not following the EEOC's criminal history guidance or the, the state laws in a number of places that say a crime has to be substantially related to the job in order to be used by an employer. Right? It's a good time to get rid of black and white outcomes and to move instead to a we will review it. You know, If you want to have part of your matrix say in certain situations we won't care at all, you know, th that's fine too, you know, that's fine too. For certain minor stuff, you won't care. We don't. It, it won't impact the hiring process at all. Fine. Um, but the ones that w you you believe will impact your thinking, it's better to say review than to say automatic exclude. Um, one thing that can help employers to deal with the burden of the individualized assessment criteria is to place some of the burden on the job applicant. Right? So if you remember that the individualized assessment criteria are really seven or eight different factors that the EEOC believes you ought to consider in deciding whether the individual really presents the threat that you thought they did when you first evaluated their criminal conviction. Right? Um, one option that you have is to ask some or all of those questions in writing to the applicant and to ask them to answer them within say five days or a week um, or ten days. As you know in many situations the job applicant will not follow through on answering those questions. So then you're in position to exclude the applicant not based necessarily on the criminal conviction but on the on the fact that they basically weeded themselves out of the hiring process. That's useful. It's also useful because you're getting all this writing back from the applicant. And so inevitably within the you know five, six, seven, eight questions that the applicant answers, there will be material that you can use to say, here's why I didn't hire this particular individual. And so think about that from a class action perspective. We talked about earlier how class actions involve copycat thinking, right? The company did the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Well, if you're getting individualized assessment writing back from uh, job applicants and you're making individual determinations based on those writings, 
How could a judge say you handled each situation exactly the same such that um, if, if the judge believes you made the wrong call as to one, he can say you also made the wrong call as to all the other people. That's not possible, right? And so that type of um, questionnaire, I think, is often very useful for employers. It's also possible to incorporate that questionnaire at a time when it won't slow down your hiring process. For example, you know, as many of you know, if you're running a background check through a third-party provider like Free Employee, you've got to go through the adverse action process, right? This should sound familiar to, to most of you. So in the adverse action process, you know, if you're thinking about taking adverse action against someone, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the federal law governing background screening procedure, says you send a, a pre-adverse action letter to the individual saying, we're thinking about taking adverse action against you. You include a copy of summary of your rights under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and you include a copy of the background screening report so that the individual can take a look at that report and say, this is not me, or yes, I, you know, I do have a criminal conviction, but for, it's for something different. Um, and then, you know, under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, you wait a reasonable period of time, usually five uh, business days or something like that, and you follow it up if there's all silence with the post-adverse action letter, which specifies certain rights under federal law. That should sound familiar to most of you, right? Well, one option is to include this individualized assessment questionnaire at the time of the pre-employment, or at the time of the pre-adverse action letter because you're going to have to wait the reasonable period of time for them to say it's not me anyway, right? And so at, in that reasonable period of time they can also be hopefully putting together a response to your individualized assessment questions. So in that way you won't be slowing up the hiring process at all but you will be incorporating some of the EEOC's um, requirements for lack of a better word and you'll be getting information that you can use to avoid a class action certification if for some reason you're challenged on it. Um, another piece of the individualized assessment analysis to think about is building in a credibility uh, determination in your individualized assessment. It's not something that the EEOC talks about, but again it can help you to get out from a potential class action. Think about it this way. If you're getting a written questionnaire response from applicants or you're even talking over the phone with them and you're writing down notes about that, right? As you're listening to them, you're probably reaching some conclusion about whether you think that the individual is remorseful for his or her crime, whether they're credible, whether they're sincere about turning over a new leaf, things like that. Um, if you're making credibility determinations about individuals, and those credibility determinations are based on specific information that you're receiving from the applicant in each case, again, how can you have a class action saying, you had a background screening policy that had a disparate impact overall against all applicants. No, the only way to assess whether someone uh, potentially should not have been excluded based on criminal history information in a way that uh, runs afoul of Title VII and discrimination laws is to make a case-by-case -case analysis. So again, that sort of credibility assessment I think can be useful. Um, a couple other things quickly before we're going to move on to a couple of questions and answers with uh, Bob Mather. Um, one thing again, follow state law automatic disqualifiers. So we talked about earlier about the Cincinnati uh, public schools case in which an employer did actually face a lawsuit for doing nothing more than complying with state law. Um, the question I get from employers is, okay, what do we do now? We're in between a rock and a hard place. And the answer is, is you are. Um, but the other answer is, where is the risk greater? Right? And what I hear from most employers is they're more concerned about the risk at the state level. They're more concerned about having their license taken away. Or they're more concerned about facing an audit from the state than they are about the relatively unlikely chance that they're going to be sued by the EEOC or face a Title VII suit. So on balance, for most employers, it makes sense to continue following state law automatic disqualifiers but then to incorporate the EEOC guidance where things are, are squishy. So again, in my home state of Wisconsin, in that Wisconsin caregiver law we talked about earlier, you know, there are 10 automatic disqualifiers for things like murder. If someone's going to be a caregiver and they've been convicted of a murder, they're out for sure. But there's another five where it says the employer should do a deeper dive. Those are for kind of lesser offenses that the state nonetheless thinks could potentially be significant. Well, on those 
deeper dive ones, on the squishy ones, it often makes sense for an employer to factor in some of the individualized assessment criteria that the EEOC advocates for. So in those situations where the state doesn't say you have to exclude, but you may want to exclude, it makes sense to be doing a deeper dive if that's typically what you do. Um, it's really important to stay, uh, to stay on track in terms of monitoring state law and municipal changes. As I've mentioned a few times today, things are evolving rapidly in this area. Um, the criminal history question alone um, is getting an awful lot of scrutiny at the state and municipal level. There are many states and municipalities now that say you and employer cannot ask a criminal history question at the, at the employment application stage. You either have to wait post-interview or post-conditional offer. Okay, That is going to continue to take hold with all likelihood over the next several years. And so it's going to be all the more important to keep track of that. If you have a multi-state presence, you very well might need to, and you, and you want to ask a criminal history question on your employment application, you very well might need to be including certain disclaimers saying, if you're in this state or if you're in this municipality, do not answer this question. Okay? What I'm telling most of my employers at this point is, why deal with the fuss? In most situations, you can get the exact same information you need later on in the process. You know, you can ask it post-interview or you can ask it uh, post-conditional offer. And then you can compare the information that the applicant provides against the background screen report and get a lot of the same value that employers originally derived from the criminal history question. But you can do it without the controversy that comes from asking that question so early in the process. You know, one of the things I liken it to is, you know, in, in most employers would not ask whether someone has a disability on the employment application, even though they know that if someone has a disability that it requires an employment uh, accommodation, they're probably going to have to deal with it later on. Right? You don't ask that question because you don't want to deal with the controversy. You don't want to deal with suspicion that you're improperly excluding someone based on information that you should. Um, I think reasonable minds can disagree on that, but that's where most of my employers are coming down at this point. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to mention today is don't lose sight of the FCRA procedural risks. You know, we talked a little bit earlier about the adverse action process. You'll also know about the written consent requirement. You can't run a background check through a third-party provider unless you get written consent, and that consent needs to meet certain uh, rules of the game under both the state and the federal level. The, the risk of getting sued today is larger as to the Fair Credit Reporting Act and it's larger as to state and municipal than it is as to the EEOC in Title VII. If you're balancing risks on the spectrum, the FCRA is probably your biggest concern. Um, because we talked earlier about class action cases. Well, think about class actions when they come to FCRA procedural stuff. If you're not getting the right written consent for one person, you're probably not getting the right con written consent for all people. That's a class action. And under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, a, a plaintiff's attorney um, cannot just get um, actual damages if they allege recklessness or they allege intentional indifference. They can get statutory damages of $100 to $1,000 per applicant, per situation. And they can also get unlimited punitive damages. And they can get attorney's fees. Um, FCRA class actions are taking off because they're so easy for plaintiff's attorneys to get through if, in fact, an employer is not following some or all of those rules. So at the end of the day, if you're trying to figure out what am I going to audit first, it generally makes sense to look at the FCRA stuff and then move on to the EEOC and individualized assessment stuff next. Um, these are some of the lessons that I've learned having practiced extensively in this area over the last eight years. and um, Hopefully, all of this is of help to you. Um, Bob, I'd love to hear if, uh, if you have any follow-up thoughts or questions. No, I really appreciate your time today, Scott. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Okay. Um, and you guys all have a great day. And we will um, gladly be able to answer any follow-up questions. We'll have some uh, information on, the, on your screen in, 
that you can email or call and either Scott or one of our representatives will get back to you. Okay. So thanks a lot, Scott. Yeah. Thank you. I very much I very much appreciate the opportunity and um, hope to see all of you soon.